Hallelujah. Let's get uh, started. Um, I just finished up. Some of you uh, heard the tail end of the mission statements of praise and worship. How many um, desire uh, more um, free worship than we've had yet? Because <laughs> I do. I want all the freedom I can get. I want the plow unhooked. Um, I still dance kind of with a plow attached. <laughs> and uh, that's what, if you ever wonder why pastor sits in the front row, you ever wonder? Maybe you thought because I'm pastor. No, I sit here in the front row because I learned a long time ago that I can't see anybody else. I look straight ahead and close my eyes and I worship and nobody affects me, right? If I sit in the back, oh, what are they all going to think tonight? And I remember raising one hand and barely getting one hand up, and it was awful. And then it took, so finally, I, uh, Tim Hawkins, right? And I finally get that one hand up, and oh, ah, ah, I worship. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, uh, and uh, then I found out that it was just as hard to get the second hand up as it was the first hand. Because I worshiped like that for several weeks, and then it was like, it's time to get the other one up, and the other one didn't want to go. And finally, eventually, I got free from what people think, and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to sit in the front because it just, I don't have to deal in the natural. Uh, and so then I trained myself to st sit in the front, and it's never quit stopped. <laughs> that was before I was pastor. Okay, well, it's good to see everybody here. It's good to see people uh, passionate about serving. And um, how many think and believe that uh, there's some change that has been happening here recently at Church of the Word. <laughs> so I want to just explain change a little bit. How many uh, get uncomfortable when there's change in their life? <laughs> I'm still working on getting comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? So I want to just talk to you a little bit what, how change works, and maybe you'll understand it a little bit more. Anytime that there's change, there's always a lie presented. Anytime there's change, there's a lie presented. The lie goes something like this. Well, if there's a big change in your life, it's going to get worse. Anybody ever hear that lie? There's big change ahead in your life, but to, to pursue that change, it becomes, it's just, so, so in other words, then you also get hit with the next lie of the fear of the unknown. Well, I just don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. What if it's worse than what I have? Anybody been lied to like that? What if it's worse, Daniel? What if it's worse than what I have right now? But I got chaos in my life. It's awful. It's terrible. But the unknown, what if it's worse? And so I stay in chaos. I become, that becomes normal to me. My chaos becomes normal because I'm afraid to change. I'm afraid to step out of the boat. I'm afraid to walk by faith. This happens to you probably like almost every day that you're presented with this. There's change. Somebody, you'll, you'll think something, you'll read something, you'll look at something and go, huh, I could make my life better. Yeah, but I'd have to change this, this, and this. And I don't know that I want to change. I don't know that I really want that kind I mean I want change in my life but are you telling me that kind of change I mean that's pretty radical that's pretty radical I don't know and, and you will settle and put up with those things in your life that you hate that you wish were different that you sit there and you might even cry about you're very frustrated about you're going oh my word can't believe I do this every day, but you will continue to do it day after day, year after year, because you're afraid to change, because you've believed the lie that stepping out of your comfort zone, out of what you know, which is hectic and awful, but stepping out of what you know could be worse. I'm here to present to you that change is beneficial to you. I'm here to present to you that embracing change is good. 
I'm here to present to you that church changing is a good thing. I'm pretty happy about some of these new people that decided to come, and, and we're better for it. See, if we would never change, we wouldn't let any visitors come. Because what if they believe different? Right? And, and, and then it becomes us four and no more. And, and, and we'll never grow. See, growth, if you're adamant about having growth in your life, you become adamant of having change in your life. Y'all hear, hear me or y'all kind of tuned out and going, eh, I didn't come for this. I was coming up to sign up for kids church or something. And here he's talking about some radical change. What in the world? Yeah, well, part of what the Church of the Word is going, uh, headed to, is there's change that's happened. So with change, there's a believing of the lie that it's going to be worse than before. And then the second thing that you will naturally go through is a grieving process. You will then go through a grieving process. Because there's part of you that was kind of comfortable with what was going on and you kind of liked it even though it was chaos. And you kind of liked it and there becomes a grieving process that you go through. Now one of the mistakes I've made as, as a pastor and a leader and somebody that embraces change is I have not allowed people to go through the grieving process uh, and I should say this, with that grieving process comes a flood of emotions. With that grieving process, anytime there's grief, there's this flood of emotions. And you might find yourself in a conversation where you're just like, bleh! And all that junk is coming out of you because you've believed a lie. Right? You've believed a lie. You don't really want the change you set your mouth says that you want. You actually want your comfort zone because you have to take a personal inventory, look at yourself, it's uncomfortable, and you have to then be willing to say, you know what, I change. And so because of that, it brings a flood of emotions. Well, now as pastor, one of the mistakes I've made, and I'm repenting of it, I'm going to make some new commitments tonight, is uh, I have processed change in my quiet times. And I've known about some change that the Lord showed me and given to me and given me direction. And I knew it was change, but I let myself process this for three months. And then I presented it to the church and I gave them no time. And I'm like, buck up, you church people. We're changing. <laughs> and so I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't done a better job of that and I repent of it and I want to give you as much of a, a time to process some things as I give myself because some of this stuff is things we have to wade through and learn right about ourselves how we react what we do and and because in that flood of emotions that come with the grieving part of change the grieving part of change, that flood of emotions, you may do things or say things that are really not totally you. I, I want you to take ownership of it, that it came out of you, but yet that you were, because of the lie you believed, it, it causes you to do things that aren't your norm, right? You understand what I'm saying? And so uh, you, maybe you're uh, ashamed of some things that you've said or or or. Uh, emotions came out uh, and because of some of the change that's happening. So uh, one of the things that changed here just recently that uh, I'm gonna, I have committed myself to open and honest communication and, and uh, in love with grace, seasoned with grace. And one of the big changes that have happened recently is Jason uh, stepped down from being worship leader. Now some of you have uh, just come and kind of came right at that time, didn't really know what was going on. And with that change, Kim is now the worship leader. Now, Jason has left, uh, I guess, the, the, and I'd say the same thing if he'd be sitting here. But uh, it was a mutual agreement. Uh, Jason uh, agreed that, uh, that there was some things, uh, some time that he needs to spend time with his family. He has three smaller children with his wife. In the last three years, there's been a lot of things happening in requirements and you know, things that 
you know, he, he was a worship leader day in and day out, week in and week out, uh, week in and week out, I should say. And um, so there was just some, some things for him to step back. Um, and, and I lo- told him, I said, please, Jason, this is a time for you uh, to grow and, and to become, and, you know, take some inventory in life and, and go forward in life. Don't, don't go backwards, right? And he received it very, very well, and he's walked in honor. And, uh, but that's just an example of something that shifted. Now, I did announce this in May. Some of you weren't here. I don't know if you went and listened to the, uh, to the, to the uh, recording or not, but it was recorded. It was put online. And uh, so you had the opportunity to go listen to. But the reason I'm addressing it now, again, is because I want to continue to give you the time to process it, and I want to encourage you not to grieve over it. It's a good thing for Jason. He actually agreed that it's a good thing for him and his family so that they can come up to a higher level because there is a lot of pressure, requirements, things that, you know, not, it's just the, the anointing and the mantle of, a, of an office and that some of you will not understand until you carry it, right? I don't, you know, if, if somebody would come up to me and say, Jay, uh, we're releasing you from the church and being pastor and, and from this church. And, and, you know, we would agree it's the Holy Spirit and somebody else would come in and pastor. I mean, it would probably feel like I could float. Like it'd be like, see you later, I can fly, right? And that doesn't mean I hate my position or I hate my job. It simply means that the mantle would be lifting off of me, Right? And it would then come on to somebody else. And you may not understand that unless you experience it. But anyway, uh, we agreed. It was a mutual agreement between Jason and I that, yes, this would be a good thing for him. Give him some rest. Give him some time to spend the time with his family and some of his young children. And so I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood and everybody was clear. And please don't believe the lie that it's going to be bad for everybody. See, see, that's the lie. It's not going to be bad for everybody. The Holy Spirit doesn't ask us to do things so it's bad for you. Okay? The Holy Spirit doesn't operate that way. The Holy Spirit wants everybody to come up and grow up, right? And grow up, come to another level. So Jason is going to experience growth in his life. I'm believing it for him. He's going to experience growth in his life. Kim had to step to the plate. She didn't even want to be worship leader when this was first presented and she's growing and there's been a tremendous amount of growth and there's going to be other people asked to step up and and the reason I'm talking about this first of all commitment to honesty a commitment to the truth and and um, also just I want to uh, talk about it again so that you can process it and you do not have to continually grieve at change God had, God did, see, God's not there trying to have you grieve because of change. And then with that grieving comes emotions and emotions you may not know how to deal with and you may then do things that are outside your norm. And one of the things that happens, and I'm just going to hit this head on because we're going to have open and honest communication in love, seasoned with grace. I'm going to say that so many times that you're going to go, Jay, why you say it so often? Because I want you to get it. With that, there's been gossip. Some of you have been part of it. Some of you have repented. I have not arrived in all things non-gossiping. But you know, when people come outside of an organization that haven't been here for over a year asking questions because they heard something happen, it's not hard for me to connect dots, okay? I can connect dots. I'm not stupid. Now, I'm going to shrug them off and say, oh, well, that's on them, and it is, but gossip will ruin you. And as your pastor, I'm asking you to come to a higher level and get free from gossip. It will destroy you. That's why the Word talks about it. If you want, Proverbs has verse after verse. In fact, Proverbs tells tells me that you do not trust a friend 
that gossips. He's untrustworthy. If you want to be trusted, one of the things you got to get rid of is gossip. And they all said, Amen. <laughs> that was a good point, but some of you are still grieving over the change that's happening from the pulpit. You know, truth, do you, do you welcome truth into your life? Do you like having truth tellers in your life? Or do you like to have people that avoid truth? I think all of us, if we're honest, would say, hey, I want, I, you know, I would really appreciate if somebody tells me the truth. And, you know, it's, it's very simple things. You know, uh, I remember, I had to deal this with myself. You know, Daniel here, if I have the best interest for Daniel here, and uh, let's say he eats a snack right before he walks in the church, and he's got, or maybe he shaved right before he came, but he's got this big splotch of shaving cream right in the side of his cheek, and he hasn't washed it off. But I know that he usually dresses to the nines, and he likes to be dressed up, and Daniel walks in the church, and I have a conversation with Daniel, but I can't even tell him, look at him and tell him that he's got something on his cheek. I don't love Daniel. Why? I have his best interests in mind. If I'm like, hey, dude, uh, you got something right here. Uh, maybe you want to go wash it. Because everybody else, he's the first guy that shows up at church, and I tell him, he goes and washes it, and nobody knows. But if I don't love Daniel, I let him there with that shaving cream on the side of his cheek, and everybody sees shaving cream on Daniel's cheek. And he goes back to his car, and he's on the way home to Grand Junction, and he looks in the mirror, and he goes, Oh, my God! I can't believe there's shaving cream on my cheek. And nobody said, because everybody was afraid of offending Daniel. That's wrong. The same way, I'm using shaving cream for an example, and it's humorous, but the same thing in different things in our life. If I cannot speak and be a truth-teller, or welcome truth, it is, we have to have this in our lives if we want to work together. See, we're, we're here tonight because we want to serve together in the church. We want to serve as a body. But if I can't trust people, if I'm not trustworthy, I mean, it stops, starts with me. I have to be trustworthy. Would you like a pastor that runs around and gossips? I'm sure every one of you would say no. Well, then what's the difference? I mean, think about it. You came to pass her with a problem, and next thing, half the community knows. You had a prayer request, and you thought it was safe. None of you would stay in a church like that. But see, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And something Kim and I have been adamant about is erasing gossip out of our life. I don't think we've even arrived yet, but as God has given us light, we have learned to hate it. And we've had to hate it. We had to go around and say, I hate gossip. I hate it. I will not participate at the family reunion. I will not participate when I have people over. I hate gossip and will not participate. We've had to do that. And I'm asking all of us to come to a higher level in this because without having trust one to another, then we can't serve well and great. We can serve on the surface, but how many here just want a surface relationship? Anybody interested in a surface relationship? Anybody here just want to talk about the weather and when the hay is to be bailed? And, uh, well, you know, what did the kids do today? Oh, took them to sport. How many want those conversations? Or how many want iron sharpening iron? How many actually want in-depth depth relationship? And if something is, needs to be said, and a truth teller, I want to be a truth teller. I'm committing to be a truth teller. And I'm asking you, I'm just presenting it to you, and you can, tell, you can decide if you want to be a truth teller. And a truth teller sometimes does confront Okay? A truth teller at times does confront. And when, and when the confrontation comes, how many know that confrontation can be done in love? Confrontation can be done in love. 
Well, now I just plumb lost my notes for tonight. Where'd they go? Did I not have... No, that's praise and worship. There it is. How many know that confrontation can be done in love? Did Jesus confront the Pharisees or did he just, well, I'm not going to have an argument today? Which one did he do? Did he walk in love? Was he the one we're to get our examples from? You know, if somebody's off, you need to be able to look them in the eye and say, you know what, you're off. I want an environment with truth tellers. I want an environment of serving because we're going to work together on a close level and we need truth tellers in our life. Now, I don't mean truth tellers and confrontation are not synonyms to being mean. (laughs) That doesn't mean you come running in here all mad and angry, yelling and screaming because one of our core values is what? What's our core value? Open, honest communication in love with grace. Seasoned with grace, right? It's one of our core values. I'd suggest you write your, uh, the core values down. Put them in your car. Put them on your refrigerator. They'll do you a lot of good. What I, what I want to talk about, really, what I want to talk tonight is relentless growth. I've already been talking about this. And growth requires change. If this church is going to grow, if we're going to bring 100 to 200 people because we're open to the community, which we say we are, then we need to embrace change, okay? And we need to stop grieving, because I can already see it happening. The next stage is, you know, everybody's, it's all full in here. All the seats are filled. People are getting set free, delivered, all these things. And somebody will say, Oh, I just kind of wish it was back when it was just a couple of us. It was so much better. And the truth teller in your life is going to say, no. God called us to reach the community. And if he called us to reach the community, you're not going to say that. Because all you want is comfortable little you. These new people that come here, they, 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 you talk about relentless growth, they got it. They want relentless growth yesterday. <laughs> Growth requires change. Change usually carries grief because we believe the lie that change is negative. Growth actually energizes us. You know, a tree that's growing is actually a healthy tree. Without growth, we're not healthy. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go over the mission statement. We'll go back and we're going to look at our mission statement, what it stands for, look at our vision. So the mission statement for uh, Church of the Word is this. God has called us to transform, equip, and mobilize all believers to fulfill the destiny of their lives. This can only be accomplished in a team environment. How many know that pastor cannot do it all? How many know that if you come in with your own vision, you have what? Die means two, right? If you look up into root words in the English language, die. So if you have a way you want to do it, and it's different than what Pastor Jay and Kim want to do it, what is that? So you are probably going to do things differently than Jay and Kim. Let's just get that straight. How many think you're going to agree with Jay and Kim on everything? I mean, if you do, you can raise your hand. (laughs) And I'll be like, thank you, Jesus, we found somebody. But I guarantee you that's not going to happen. So there's always going to be presentation and a temptation of bringing your own vision to the table. And if you push through with your own vision, what do you have? Division. And do we grow with division? No. We don't. Now, I will hear you out. You guys, a lot of you guys that have known me over the last three to four years. Peggy has known me for probably 10 years now, and I will hear you out. I'm not going to run you out the door and tell you you're stupid and crazy and just get out, okay? I'm going to hear you out, but it may not be the way we do it. I'll just bring an example again. The worship team, most some of them left, but you know, in the last two months, 
I've had complaints about the music being too loud, and I've had the com uh, a complaint about the music, the drums not being loud enough. Now, who should I listen to? Anyone want to be in my shoes and try to decipher on who, who I should listen to? Too loud or not loud enough? Who should I prefer? <laughs> See, we got to laugh every now and then. It's gotta, we got to joke around, right? We got some twins over here. <clears throat> I don't know, Eugene. I'm going to have to send you flowers, buddy. <laughs> so, so anyway, I'm just using that as an example. Now, what does pastor do? Some people are upset that it's not, it's too loud. And we addressed this in the worship team. Some of you weren't here, but we addressed it. And now we got not loud enough. So what does pastor do? Well, I guess to keep the peace, we'll, one weekend we'll have too loud and one weekend not loud enough. No, we're going to find a place that Kim and I are relatively happy with and we, we generally have, and that's where we're going to put it. And I told the worship team, I'm telling the whole church, we're actually going to buy some earbuds and put them in the back, and they're special earbuds that bring decibel levels down, 10 to 15 decibels, and you are welcome to use it. And the reason we have loud worship is because, number one, it's biblical, and number two, in the natural, not everybody knows how to sing. And I am not... <laughs> not everybody knows how to sing. And so, because of that, our, our target audience is not my background of ex-Mennonites. I'm not trying to target people that just like to sing with the hymnal. I'm targeting the community of Delta. And because of that, a lot of the people coming in here don't know how to sin, sing, have never uh, carried a tune, don't know how to. And let me tell you, I'm sure the first people to complain are the ones that complain how it wasn't loud enough or the 15, if they have 15 people in here singing at the top of their lungs off key. You're not going to want to hear that. So that's why we elevate the decibels and get it to a point so that I, I just can't, you know, maybe I can hear them if I'm right beside them, but I can't hear them if they're halfway across the room. So that's, in the, it, first of all, biblical, number two, natural. And, if, and I, I'm not going to take the time to go through uh, all the Hebrew words that talk about ear-splitting, ear-splitting worship. Ear-splitting. So I don't know what that means to you. But I bet you they could say, God, it's too loud. Right? And he's asking, if you go in the psalm, you can look up the Hebrew words, and these words mean split the ear with noise, with trumpet blasts. And, and then I go to this. If you can't take 30 minutes out of your entire week and listen to some loud music, what is wrong? Just a question. Anyway. Back to our mission statement. So our mission statement is the word team, is from the team environment. Team, meaning transformation for T, equipping, accountability, and mobilization. That spells the word team. Transformation, equipping, accountability, and mobilization. We believe that this church, Church of the Word International, is to transform you first and foremost. It's to equip you equip you in the ways and things of God. It's also going to bring some accountability. Accountability means there'll be truth tellers in your life. Truth tellers. Somebody willing to tell you the truth. We all sit here going, yeah, it's, I want to hear the truth. Now the thing we got to ask us, what if it's offensive to me? Anytime there's an offense in my life is because part of it is true. And I'm not willing to receive it. That's what brings about offense. Put it this way. Let's make this, I want to try to make this easy and interactive. Uh, think of something that's not me. Totally not me. Anybody got something? What's not me? What does Jay not do? Come on, somebody's got something. Somebody comes to me and says, Jay, I seen Jay drunk and at the bar. How many believe in it? Anybody believe in here? So they come to me and say, Jake, we've seen you drunken at the bar. I heard this story. You were drunken at the bar. I laugh. 
I'm going, <laughs> I wasn't at the bar, and I guarantee you I wasn't drunk. It's not even offensive. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not, I'm not offended. I'm not offended at all because it's not the truth. Now, what if we bring dial that in where it's kind of partial truth, some of it's kind of true, and, and I'm kind of, and kind of got out. And somebody comes to me, and, and they're a truth teller, and they're like, you need to clean this up in your life. And I go away offended. Why? Because it was truth. Now, people can miss it in the delivery. Maybe they delivered it 100% wrong. It could have been in the flesh. It could have been incorrect the way they handled it, the way they spoke it to me, the way they said it to me. Everything could have been wrong. And I could use all those excuses and say, yeah, but they said it like this. They were angry. They were this. They were that. All this stuff. And I become defensive, right? And all these things but I'm offended because it's partially true. Partially true. And so I usually, when things come up that I am offended about, or let me rephrase that, I have the temptation to be defended, or or, uh, uh, to be offended. How many know that offense is a temptation first and foremost? Then if we take the bait of offense, then we've entered in. So it's... I. I can be, I, I have temptation to be offended by Kim probably on a daily basis. <laughs> now she's offended. Because <laughs> there may be slight truth about it, right? No, but we, we're very open and honest in our conversation. And I know how we've had some people say, boy, if they, you, you guys, if, 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 if they would talk, my, my husband or wife would talk like that to us, we'd have some serious issues. Well, I know she's not leaving, right? She has my heart. And because of that, we're not easily offended. I'm not never saying that we've never taken the bait. We haven't arrived, but we sure have left. But we're not easily offended. And, and it, 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 it's part of the transformation that's happening in our lives. So transformation, equipping, accountability, and mobilization. We want to mobilize you into the, your gifts and your callings. So here's the vision. God has called us, Church of the Word, to transform, equip, and mobilize all believers to fulfill the destiny of their lives. This can only be done, accomplished, or can only be accomplished in a team environment. We believe God deserves our best, and we pursue excellence to see His purposes fulfilled in every person. One way we love God is by loving one another. Amen? The call of the church, the body of Christ, and the work of the ministry is to be an express agency of God for the evangelization of the world. For this church, this body, specifically Delta, right? Now, there is some things, I'm doing some things in Ukraine, there's different things that we'll do, but specifically for this town. I'm not looking uh, to, to, again, I'm saying this again because apparently we need to get this in our heads I am not evangelizing ex-Mennonites. I'm not evangelizing other religions. Now, they can come here and we can help them. We can get them spirit-filled. They're welcome here, but that's not my target audience. My target audience is the community. Okay, Anybody coming in. So if they're a new believer, and like we had several months ago, we had a a dear soul come, and he was drunk. Now, some of you, Kim and I, observed some things when that happened. Some of you had some statements about how it was tough to even hug him. You probably need to look at that. Because if you can't love the unlovely, that's a problem. At one point, you were unlovely, and God still loved you. But you're too good to now love somebody you deem unlovely. (laughs) 
Yeah. Yes, he was. Now, we don't allow him to stay there. We want them to come to a higher level. And something we don't even have in place right now is something for new believers. And we need to get that in place. And we will be working on that. The evangelization of the world, mainly Delta for this church, to seek and save that which is lost, drawing all into union within the body and establishing within the body a proper worship of the Godhead in the unity of faith. So here's four things, four C's that as, as um, servers, you guys, uh, I'm going to make the assumption that you've listened to all 11 messages on saved to serve. Now, I shouldn't make that assumption, maybe, but I'm going to because I don't really want you to answer it because I kind of have a feeling not all of you did. I'm not being critical about it. I'm just simply saying that's the vein we're going into to learn to become better servers. So I highly recommend listening to all 11, not just the first 15 minutes of the first one, but all 11. So here's the four C's. Number one, uh, this is the four C's of relentless growth. Number one, confrontation. You need to confront where you're at. You need to confront your situation. You need to confront what's happening. See, this whole thing of not thinking about it, but I'm just going to run around and get busier in life, so I can't think about the things uh, that I don't like in life, is not going to work. You need to confront yourself and say, whoa, time out. There's some things I need to change. And because of that, I'm going to now involve myself in open and honest communication with my husband or my wife because I need some things changed in my marriage. In love, seasoned with grace. And you need to talk. You need to open your flapper. You're so good at talking about everything else that doesn't matter. You ought to be able to talk about things that do matter. And have an open, honest conversation in love, seasoned with grace, with your significant other, because the two of you are not one. Okay? I'm going to be a truth teller. You need to become one. It's paramount that you become one in life and one vision in life. Because again, if you bring your own vision and your husband brings the other vision, what do you have? Die vision. And then you wonder why you have issues. Well, that's why. It's because there's two visions. So, confrontation. Growth, your growth journey begins because you're willing to confront where you're at. And, and you have to start saying, I'm willing to grow at all costs. At all costs. Because some people aren't. You know, I've read this as a pastor. I've read this and I always thought, ah, oh, come on. Can't be like that. But as churches grow and pastors expand their sphere of influence, you know people leave because they can't handle it. People leave because they can't handle the growth. They can't handle the change. They, they just, they're, it just, they're just like, they're not willing to go with. You know, think about it. If we would tomorrow be 200 people, you would lose this, right? But we can say we're all for reaching the community, but then our actions are everything but that. Confrontation. Growth journey begins when you're willing to confront things in life. Number two, uh, it needs to come to conviction. Now, if you're wondering, well, where's your Bible? Go read Peter, how Peter um, interacted with Jesus. So Jesus tells Peter, uh, one of you is going to deny me, right? Um, and, and Peter goes, what does Peter say? He goes, not me. I'll lay my life down for you, Jesus. And what does he do uh, about a couple hours later? What does he do? Denies Jesus. So where did the confrontation happen? The rooster crows, and what happens? It's the third time. Peter hears it, and what happens? 
He remembers and Jesus looks. I don't know about you, but do you think you want to receive Jesus' look about that time? You think that, I mean, I'm sure Jesus was loving him in the look, but he simply is looking going, I told you that you would do this, and he vehemently denied, I would never do this over my dead body. So now Peter is, uh, he is now right up against the confrontation. Now Judas, what did Judas do? When, when the prophecy was, happened that he did, what did he do? Did he receive, did, was he willing to confront himself? Nope. He ran out and took his life. See, that's what the non-confrontational spirit, the passive-aggressive spirit will do if it's taken to the extreme. It, 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 he, he wanted nothing to do. He thought it was an unforgivable sin that he committed with Jesus, that he couldn't be forgiven for, and he ran out. And he hung himself. But Peter, he took the confrontation. Now, he, Peter's got to look internally. He's got to confront where he's at. Where am I at? I screwed up majorly. I just did exactly what I swore I wouldn't do. In other words, from that confrontation, he got conviction. He got, conviction. He got convicted of what he's doing. He goes, oh my word. I can't believe I did it. Uh, if I remember correctly, they both wept bitterly, right? They both wept, but one took his life, Judas took his life, and Peter decided, you know what, I'm changing. I'm changing. I, this is not okay in my life. This is not okay in my life. In other words, the confrontation brought conviction to his life, and he resisted the tendency to defend, justify, and blame. How many like people that defend themselves, justify themselves, and blame everybody else? How many people like that? How many people like those people and have them as close friends in your life? If they tend to defend, what, what is defend? How does this look? Let, let's, let's try to figure this out. I want to make this real. It's an excuse. It's never their fault, right? Well, you know, um, you know so-and-so uh, made me do it. Or, actually, let's make it really spiritual here. Um, this is, a, uh, Adam, or this is a, a thing that happens in the church world. Um, the devil made me do it. Sounds holy, doesn't it? Well, you know, I couldn't help it. The devil made me do it. It's not my fault. And there's no responsibility. See, you cannot change unless you take responsibility you have to come from a place of re responsibility which oh by the way is one of our core values we'll get that to in a little bit so conviction Tend uh, uh, conviction is um, anytime you get to a place where you want to defend yourself justify yourself and blame somebody else then you need to look at that and say why am I wanting to do that and then you have a choice. Do I come from responsibility or do, I come from, or do I stay as a victim? Because a victim always blames somebody else, justifies their actions, and defends what they do. And you can take any kind of sin and they'll do this. Or you can come from a place of responsibility and, and own it and ownership. The third one is commitment. Growth is not an option. It is essential to your life. See, it's, it's fun to talk about growth in a, in a... Well, maybe you don't think it's fun tonight. I don't know. I had time to process it. You're probably still in the grieving stage. But uh, I've had time to process it because I got ready for the sermon. <laughs> so I'll be gr full of grace with you if you're processing right now and you're kind of thinking that... I, I don't know if I like this new pastor because he's kind of like uh, saying things I don't know if I agree with. Um, but growth is not an option. It's essential. If you don't welcome growth in your life, you will, die. You will continue to die. Right? And, and um, commitment, you will come to a place where you will then commit to something different. And you're going to have to commit. Actually, I have three C's, not four. Confrontation, conviction, and commitment. Growth is not an option. It is essential. Now, what keeps us so what keeps us from changing? 
What keeps you from changing in life? What keeps you from... You don't like where you're at, so you want something different. What keeps you where you're at? What's that? Sphere? Fear. Fear of the unknown, right? Fear of the unknown keeps us from changing. Um, how does this sound if I'm not willing to come from a place of responsibility? If I come from a place of victimhood, how does this sound? Come on, surely. What did I do to deserve this? Oh my word, it was their fault. They were the idiots. Right? He was the idiot. She was the idiot. It's their fault. They're to blame. And we're not willing to look at ourselves. See, change causes you to look at yourself, and that's fear. That's scary because I might have to do things different in my life. In other words, I have to step out of the boat and get over myself and do things I don't want to do. And since I don't know how to do it, I'm afraid of it. And so I don't move. And here I exist for year after year after year because I am not really committed to changing. It's good in theory, and it's good when the pastor talks about it, and I like to nod my head. But when I actually got to apply it, eh, I don't want to do it. See, the other thing that fights against this is complacency. You're like, eh, well, you know, my life's actually kind of good. I kind of like my life. I don't really have to change. Why do I have to change? I mean, yeah, there's some things I kind of don't like, but... Yeah, it's okay. And uh, so I'm just going to sit here and just be okay with whatever's okay. Oh, every now and then, about every third, fourth month, I'm really angry about how things are going in my life. But eh, for the most part, eh, just kind of okay. I am complacent. Complacent is the enemy of change. Enemy of change. Complacency is the enemy of change. Well, then, uh, finishing it with Peter, um, and we see the confrontation he had with Jesus. His growth journey begins. He was convicted. He repented. He committed to doing some, something different. And then in Acts, we read about the change in his life. I mean, he's like a totally different person. He doesn't care about the authorities. The fear is gone. He's walking up to the person uh, that, that's the beggar. And he's like, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have is Jesus. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. People are getting healed because Peter committed, I'm going to be different. I'm going to change. He just got done three days before denying. Like the time frame, well, actually, that was later into Acts where that happened. But still, it was relatively short, probably within 40 to 50 days, 50 days, somewhere in there, that these things were happening. And, and, uh, um, it's not that long, but he had a large amount of change happen in a very short uh, time frame. And I'm here to tell you that's available to you if you commit to it. Say, you know what? I'm going to be different. I'm not going to be offended anymore. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive. I am not taking the bait. Same way with take gossip. Same way with anything else. You know what? That's not me. I don't like that. I always feel horrible when it happens. That's what happened to me. I'd have conversations and I'd go away and I'd feel all dirty inside. And, you know, I, I finally it clicked up here in my head. You know, if I don't want to feel dirty, I stop having the conversations. And shazam, I didn't feel dirty. And, and, and I, I realized I'm like, because I, I, I would spend half a day with certain people and and no i'm not gonna tell you who they were and i'm but i spent half a day and i just felt all oh, icky like i needed a shower there was no buildup of faith and then over here i could spend a half a day with some people that built me up fired me up and i'm ready to go right and so i decided you know what jay i hate gossip and i will not participate and it still took me a while to get going and, and get on the right path. But you know what? There was hope for me. There's hope for you. You can get there. 
Core values. I'm going to go over core values for this church. Open and honest communication in love seasoned with grace. The second one is coming from a place of responsibility and ownership. And I'm specifically talking about the people that serve on a regular basis, right? And and then the third one is uh, commitment levels. Now, I (laughs) kind of have it on my phone, and uh, I was going to have it up on the screen and my fault, so, so, I, so here's a, an example. I could come from a place of victim right now. Well, you know, uh, I had a lot of stuff to do today. Um, and uh, I, I kind of forgot about it, and uh, I had a whole bunch of stuff to do, so I didn't get it done. That's a victim. Or I can come from a place of responsibility. You know, I was going to have this up on the screen, and I chose that other things were more important in my life than putting this up on the screen. Thank you. So that's an, that's an example of coming from a place of responsibility versus coming from a place of victimhood. And we have accepted the victim mentality as okay, and it should not be okay. And you will hear me ask you, if I hear victim coming out of your mouth, I'll say, this is how, what I'm going to say. I'm going to say it in love, seasoned with grace, but I'm going to say, how can you, Daniel, come from a place of responsibility? How can you come from a place of responsibility with that? Well, I just didn't know. How can you come from a place of responsibility? And the answer would go something like this. Well, you know, I didn't know, but I could have called you and asked you. Right? Now we're responsible. Now we own it. Otherwise, nothing's ever your fault, and nothing's ever owned by you, and you will continue life miserable. Um, So what I have here, and you can kind of see it on my screen, but it's different circles. Okay, that's all that is. And I'm going to read to you what these different circles mean. And again, I, I think what I, can, what I can probably do is get these printed and get them into your hand. So we all get the principle. It's just round circles, right? We got a core, right? And, and, and actually, this is, it's gray here. It's gray, but I seen it in red, kind of made it a little brighter. But these are the, this is where I want you to find yourself, okay? So on the outer ring is the crowd. The crowd is everyone welcome to church from the community. How many know all are welcome here, right? Anybody from the community who knows about Church of the Word through a personal contact with somebody here from the congregation or they've registered their contact details at some event, Church of the Word event that we had, and they attend occasional Church of the Word meetings. Occasional, right? They're on the outside ring. Now, this doesn't demean their, uh, their, this doesn't mean they're less of a person, right? Does this mean that, oh, they're on the outside of the ring, uh, we don't like them? No, this doesn't mean any of that. It's just that they come sometimes to church occasionally to church this would be something maybe every second or third month they come right how many know that we we're going to have a bunch of them right the next ring is congregation is everyone uh in the crowd who goes beyond occasional attendance attendance to uh receive recognition from church of the word leadership for successfully completing uh, some of the, like, LTS training, uh, they're very active, and they serve honorably in, in serving. So the very next ring could be you, but it's going to not take a whole lot of dedication and or time from you, right? You know, this is, yeah, there's some requirements that we're going to have. We're talking about uh, taking care of the zero to three uh, where, you know, you, you can come and you don't have to prep a whole lot for zero to three. Uh, am I right on that? Well, we got somebody back there that knows more about children than I do, but I thought they didn't have to prep a whole lot. So maybe we should listen to Kay. Um, so that's a bad example. Let's use a different example. Um, <laughs> um, uh, maybe it's washing the coffee cups. 
How many know that there's probably not a lot that goes on and you just happen to show up and wash the dishes here, right? But you do it honorably and you do it with, uh, you're going, hey, is there something I can do to help? I'm just looking for places to help. Can I wash the coffee cups? And we're like, yeah. But, you know, we're not going to ask you to spend two hours praying in, in the Spirit and make sure you have a word of wisdom before you come and, and wash the coffee cups, right? We're not going to ask that. that. That's on you and your personal life. But as you get closer to the core, there's going to be things that are going to take a lot of your time and are very necessary for this church to go to the next level. Kim and I aren't the only spiritual, like we have this mindset that, well, the pastors are the super spiritual, the super Christians, and then it's everybody else. That is wrong. Okay? And in this serving, there's going to be things that we're going to be like, hey, uh, there's going to be, you know, Monday noon at prayer. Uh, there's some leading in prayer at Monday noon. There's some pre-service prayer that, that it needs to be led. And, and I don't know about you, but do you want somebody show up for pre-service prayer and they just had the worst week in the history of weeks and they're just completely falling apart like a $2 suitcase and they're trying to lead pre-service prayer. How many want to go attend that prayer meeting? I don't think there's anybody here. And that's why Lee and Joyce have been very uh, instrumental in pre-service prayer because I can trust them that, you know what, they kind of stay steady Eddie and uh, they're full of faith and, uh, yep, they have challenges in life, but uh, they're, they're staying on top of it, you know, for the most part. And if there is a problem, they'll come talk to me and say, you know what, been really... Uh, struggling with this. Uh, Peggy's also been somebody that we've leaned on for pre-service prayer. There's some ladies over here that, that uh, are going to get in on that um, at some point over here in this general direction. And, um, you know, th th they're, they're part of mature and are willing to pray for other people, not just, uh, I mean, think about it. If you'd have public or uh, uh, pre-service prayer and all the person could do is pray for themselves, how many would want to be part of that prayer meeting? Probably not, right? I mean, I mean, that doesn't mean we don't need prayer at times, but that's all they ever pray about is themselves, 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 and themselves, and themselves. No, corporate pre-service prayer is for others. That's the reason we have it. We're preparing the environment so that others that come in. So guess what? There's gonna, it's going to take... A little more uh, time commitment. It's going to take a serving attitude to another level. And again, this is nowhere in these rings do you become a bad person. This is just simply where you're at. And guess who gets to pick where they're at? You do. Right? And if you say, if I, if I come to you as pastor and say, hey, I really, I need you to take, take extra time doing it like this, and this is our expectation, and you're like, well, pastor, I just don't have the time. Hey, no problem. We will find somebody that can. Does that mean you run away offended and say, oh, dear Lord, pastor hates us? No. It simply is, we recognize you do not have the time capacity to put in what needs to put in to get out what we want out of it, right? This does not make you a bad person. It does not make you an evil person. It simply is what it is. And each one of us come to different places as the Lord leads. So um, that's the, the um, ring right outside of the core. And then this is the core. Core is everyone in our commit. In our, oh, this reads a little funny, forgive me here. Core is everyone in our committed who God calls. And Church of the Word pastors recognize, wow, they wrote this thing all funny. And, go, uh, and Church of the Word pastor recognizes, have qualified themselves to be Church of the Word pastoral or divisional leadership. So this, is, would, this would include like worship leader, youth leader, all these things. But there's something that has to happen on a core level 
that is above and beyond just some of the other levels, right? So this, this is what uh, the core would be. Um, Marlon and Lene, right now Marlon and Lene have been very instrumental. Peggy has been very instrumental in the core part of this. Marlon and Lene have been instrumental in the core. Lee and Joyce have been instrumental uh, on this, in this core of praying together, coming together with the same vision. I don't ever have to guess where Lee and Joyce are. And I'll never have to guess where Marlon and A. Now, there's some of you that are going to be added to this core in the very near future. In fact, we've got some people chomping at the bit. There's some maturity levels that Kim and I recognize. And it's like I told Kim today, I'm holding them back just a little bit uh, so that I can get some things straightened out over here. And tonight was, I believe, very crucial in getting some clarity on, on some of these things. And, and so expectations for a core person is 100% that they are on the same, in the same uh, vein as pastor. How do you get in the same vein as Pastor Jay and Kim? How do you get in that vein? Spend some time with them. Ask them questions. Ask them questions like this. Hey, you know what? Is there something that we could study or l messages we could listen to that you would really appreciate because it really shows your heart? I got some for you, right? Some of these things. Oh, but I don't want to listen to the messages. Hey, that's okay. You're just not part of the core. There doesn't have to be a fence. It's just simply... If you want to be part of that, of the very core leadership, there's things that need to get dialed in so that people can be on the same page. How do you not be on the same page as Pastor Jay and Kim? Everybody on the same page. Great. We can go home. How do you not be on the same page? Don't participate. Don't ask. Don't ask. Do your own thing. Do your own thing. Well, I know better than Pastor Jay and Kim, so I'm doing it like this, because I know better. That's the wrong answer, and you will not get anywhere doing that, because you are, for, you are completely ignoring unity and trying to come together. First of all, it's not my vision. The vision this church carries and the vision I'm trying to portray to all the servers is a vision that Kim and I have spent a long time praying in the Holy Spirit, developing it. And some of the things we barely know. And then when you waltz in and say, well, I know better. That tells me one thing. You don't, number one. You don't. And that doesn't mean I'm in pride about it. It simply means you need to get in and get to know our hearts so that you can serve to the capacity our expectations are. Because I want, and this is the expectation for serving, and we're going to finish up here. The expectation for serving is I don't care if you're a door greeter. I don't care if you're back in the, worship, uh, in the booth. I don't care if you're up in children's church. I don't care if you're on the prayer team. I don't care if you're on the worship team. But we want you to be in a place of victory so that when people come from the community, they're blessed by every person that's willing to serve. Because your jo our job as a church is to serve the people coming in the door. It's not serving you. Our job is not to serve you. Our job is to serve everybody coming in. All, so that's why we're here on a serving level, because we are to serve others. And then if, if the servers are going, well, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and this, and this, and that, it's going to, all it is is a little splinter that's festering, and we're not ever going to welcome the people in the way we need to welcome them and make them feel at home, because there is problems here. And maybe you think you're God's gift to us. Maybe you're like, boy, if Jay and Kim could just realize my talents, because I got a list. Well, we're going to let God, see, I, we don't go by your talent list. 
we go by the Holy Spirit directing us and, and also, do we mesh? Are we on the same page? Do you take direction well? Do you take correction well? Proverbs says, a wise man embraces correction. I've been corrected. And if you think pastor doesn't get corrected, guess again. I've got corrected so many times. I've wanted to cry when I got corrected. I'm talking about people. And I've had to go bury my nose in the carpet and get before the Lord and get free. I've had to do those things. And those things are learned. And those things are cultivated. And we're going to create a spirit, an environment of honor, an environment of service, serving others and we're going to cultivate an environment that it's not about me or you could say you but you say it's not about me it's about serving others right Eugene you got anything to add you got anything to add he looked like he was over there stewing Well, um, thank you, Jesus. That's all I have. I know I'd l- I kept you here to five minutes till nine, but I, I believe it was very necessary as a church to go through those 11 sermons. Um, Keith Moore has a way of so clearly articulating what's important in life and what service actually is. And if we embrace change if we embrace growth for this church. I pray that we don't have growth by subtraction. Anybody know what that means? So what's the definition of growth by subtraction? And, and that is heartrending to me as a pastor. I don't want to see that happen. But, you know, some people just can't get on the same vision. And if that's where they're at at, and they have to leave, I'm not being callous here, okay? It really pulls at my heartstrings. But if that keeps us from growing, because there's not unity, there's not vision, and and, and I repent for not painting more vision in this area. In fact, I was telling Kim on our Bible study nights, we're going to have more meetings like this not 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 you know maybe once every 60 days we're going to talk about some of these things because i believe it's so so necessary as we bring people in and new people come in the door we got new people newer people excuse me here tonight some of you we've only known for three months right some of you we've known for several years but we only regularly seen you for a couple months and some of you it feels like we've known each other for 10 years right and so um, that, I believe, is going to happen more and more because it's going to take all of us to serve the community. And that's the number one thing. We're here to serve the community. We're here to serve anybody that comes in. And, if we, and, and there's an appropriate way for that. If we're d- dysfunctional and can't trust each other, do not have open and honest communication, in love, seasoned with grace, how are we going to ever serve the people coming in? Because we, we can't have an open and honest conversation. If we're hurt and bitter against each other trying to serve, it's not going to work. I mean, I'm, I mean, Connor's not here tonight, but if they have that going on in the football team, the coach is constantly harping on them, hang out together, become friends, Work together, learn to work together because you're a team, you're a team, you're a team. And even as pastor, it's not about, and, and I've, I just corrected a person here in the last couple days because they messed up in front of me, and I will correct you when you say it. This is not Jay's church. It's been said, it was said that for years for some people. Wow, well, Jay's church. Jay's this, Jay's that. No, it's not Jay's church. This is church of the word. This is your church. This is your church. And, and it takes church of the word. So if you say, oh, yeah, Jay's church, I'm going to be like, stop. It's called church of the word. 
Okay? Because it's not about my church. It's about the Holy Spirit, Church of the Word. Amen? Any questions? Anybody want an open and honest communicate something in love seasoned with grace? <laughs> and we can start now. We don't have to wait. Uh, dear lady, Judy, um, I said a whole lot of stuff that's not on my notes. <laughs> but it is recorded. So we can email it to you. You can have a copy. Judy, you can have a copy, but there's a lot that I said that are not on there. Here, I do have that written down. Um, let me see here. My core values. Here's the mission statement. Yeah, I do want it back. But, but look, you do, your notes look nicer than mine. I'll use your notes next time. Any um, uh, expectations? I guess I didn't really cover expectations, but we got to go. Um, so I'll cover expectations another time. But uh, there are, when you make a commitment to Kim and I, there will be expectations to that commitment. I don't believe, I don't think we should have unhealthy expectations. Like I want to temper myself, make sure that I don't have unhealthy. So there's things, we're going to have an onboarding process to adding people to the team. Kim and I are going to sit down with you. We're going to ask you some questions. We're going to make sure we're on the same page. Now, uh, this is something I've got to address before we leave. Um, some of you uh, have been afraid of your pastors for your whole life, and you don't know how to act towards Kim and I. Because you were taught from little on up, avoid the ministry, don't let them in your life, Avoid them like the plague, and it shows. We're your friends. We're for you. We are so for you. And if, if you keep bringing that in, that because that's a hurt in your life that's never been healed, and if you continue to bring that in, um, we will, we're not going to chase you. We're not going to run you down for everything. Knock on your door and say, how you doing? I mean, think about it. If this is 400 people and we would chase every person in a 400-member church, how would that work for Kim and I? It wouldn't work. We'd frazzle out, burn out. We're not going to come chase you. You're going to have to come to us. And you're going you're gonna to have to pray and work your way through and ask the Holy Spirit to be healed from that so that you can engage with us even if we say strong things to you or things maybe you don't want to hear um, thank you jesus i'm so glad i have truth tellers in my life i'll name them for you dale armstrong bob hawk sydney rop are truth tellers in my life they've told me very strong things that i wanted to be offended thank god i had the wherewithal not to be offended because it then caused growth. And I, and, I mean, this year is probably the most challenging, growing year I've ever had in my life. And it starts with telling the truth. Any, any, question, any other questions? You had a question? No. Oh, you were just running your hand through your hair? Okay. Anybody have questions? Lee, anything that I missed? <laughs> Good question. Why would, why would you ask that? Because you're one of them. Thank you, Curtis. That's a great example. Curtis is a door greeter. I expect people to be greeted with um, opening the door with a smile on your face, maybe even a dance every now and then. Like, you are excited to be here. I mean, if you're going, opening the door, going, oh, glad you came to Church of the Word. Ain't nobody else coming in that door. 
So we, we you know, a, a smiling expression. Um, uh, I guess we have other door greeters right here. Um, and, and, you know, just saying, hey, thanks for coming to Church of the Word. We're so glad you're here. Is there, if there's anything we can do, like especially if they're visitors and you know you haven't seen them before, is if there's anything that we can help you with, with please let us know. Now, what if they'd have a request you can't help? Then you run to somebody else and say, hey, they, they asked for this. And uh, do we have that? Can we help them with this? Right? And, and so uh, they'll be, we'll give you some more direction if that would happen, because that could happen. Maybe they say, hey, I, if, if you have a bottle of water, I could use a bottle of water. Hey, we got one in the fridge. You know? Now, if they're going to ask for a Pepsi or a Dr. Pepper, we may not have them. Any other questions? Have I set, um, how do I want to say, have I done a good job of, of portraying, um, answering questions? Have I answered some of your questions that you may have been completely in the dark about? You're just like, I don't know where Jane came around. Have I answered them? Because if I haven't, then we've got to go back to the drawing board and we've got to spend some more time, but not tonight. But we've got to spend some more time answering those questions, reviewing some of these things because it's very, very important. Because I can be very clear, but yet there's also the other side. A lot of people hear where they're at. And so I can have a person over here that hears accurately and a person on this side, I'm not saying it's you, but a person on this side that hears inaccurately. And they've run out there going, oh, my word, Jay's a Nazi. <laughs> I mean, dear Lord. I mean, if you're not going, hail Hitler, he's going to kick you off the serving team. No. <laughs> Hope, hopefully nobody heard that. That'd be awful. Sure. Please come ask. Yes. And, and if it's individual questions, uh, then please do come ask those because I think I want to give some grace for a time, you know, uh, especially being as I was not clear for quite some time. So there's some things that may pertain to you individually. Please come ask us because I believe it's very important. And uh, if it does pertain to another person, uh, I may or may not be able to answer it because love also protects. And so if it's pertaining to another person, uh, I might be like, well, you know, I can't answer the, in full, but here's, here's the short redacted version because I'm here also to protect uh, things that I may know that you don't know that aren't for everybody to know, right? So, um, I think the important thing is that the instruction letter is not some sort of solution for the, for the individual to go to Okay, so maybe I should clarify. You mean as far as uh, when I was saying for the community, it was for the, the body here is serving the, the community or anybody that comes in. Yes, it is for you individually. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a great, uh, that, that's, I probably wasn't as clear on that. So as a group, as a body, we're here to serve the community. In that serving, you're going to learn, you're going to grow yourself. In fact, you will be challenged to grow. If you sit here and go, you know, I want to serve, but I ain't growing, it's not the place for you. I'm just telling you that right now. It's not the place for you because, uh, first of all, you can't handle the growth and the nothing against you. It simply is being, uh, having the maturity levels and coming up in maturity levels of being able to handle uh, radical growth in your individual life. Because it is, as we serve the community, each one of you will be changed. It will require growth from each one of you. To bring the level up here in this body 
is going to, you can't, the pastor doesn't do all the growing and everybody else stays the same. We all come up. And in fact, pastor right now uh, is being challenged. We've got some mature people that are showing up and uh, they need to be pastored. And so pastor is coming to another level that he needed to come. So thank you. I had Peggy to deal with for 10 years, but now she's got friends. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Are we all good? Everybody sewed up? Nobody going home bleeding? Nobody have a liver hanging out or kidney replacement or, or maybe you need a heart, some heart surgery? <laughs> Uh, we can pray for you before you leave. Um, everybody, okay, well, glory to God. Oh, yes, we could pray for your toes, too. Thank you, Jesus. Toes be healed in Jesus' name. Toes be healed in Jesus' name. Well, I pray that things are very, are clearer for you, and, uh, Thank you, Jesus. Um, I believe it was recorded tonight, so we'll probably put it on the LTS, sorry, Church of the Word channel, and uh, we'll put it on there. And then the one for the worship team specifically will go on the worship team channel. And uh, so some people got double dipped tonight and got four barrels in both sessions. So. Thank you, Jesus. Well, glad you came out. Uh, Kim and I love you. We want you to know that. We love you, and we want to see you continue to grow and become who you're supposed to be in the body. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. You're dismissed.